Hi, everybody. Welcome to Phoenix Fiction Writers Podcast, Episode 10, where it is our mission to write, read, and discuss science fiction and fantasy that encourages and inspires its readers. I'm Hannah Heath, writer of YA Christian Speculative Fiction, author of the Terebinth Tree Chronicles and Skies of Dripping Gold, and the multimedia manager for PFW. I'm joined today by PFW authors KL Plus Pierce and J.E. Perazzi, and we're going to talk about writing lessons we've learned from one of our favorite fandoms, which is the Chronicles of Narnia. Yay! Uh, Jill, do you want to introduce yourself and then Kristen? Yeah, I am J.E. Perazzi. I'm the speculative fiction author of the Malfunction Trilogy and the Raven Tree Society, and I am the acquisitions editor for PFW. Uh, and I'm Kirsten, also known as KL Plus Pierce. Uh, I'm a Christian specific writer and the author of Two Lives, Three Choices, and the website manager for PFW. Awesome. So I would like to point out that um, both Jill and Kirsten are superheroes because Kirsten got up at 8.30 <laughs> this morning to record the podcast and Jill had a time of technical difficulties getting here but still made it work so thank you to both of you <laughs> thank my husband he's a hero awesome. all right so this month we actually have a ton of really cool news so the first biggest most exciting piece of news is that we have a new pfw member um, her name is janelle garrett and she is pretty amazing so we released all of her information on our website so she's now an official member and i'm going to link it below so you can go check out all of her awesome books and uh, social media and all that uh the other piece of news is also related to janelle garrett she released part four of justice and it is called the dreadwood and she actually just released it a couple weeks ago i want to say um so you all can check that out that's also linked below um and then last piece of like general PFW news for me is that we have been our re we've been releasing anti-hero anthology information. So if you didn't know, seven of us PFW authors came together to create a short story anthology, and the theme's anti-hero. So E. B. Dawson's is titled Striker, Beth Wangler's is Word Thrower, J. E. Perazzi's is Stealing Freedom, uh, Nate Philbrick's is The Astoundingly Mortal Peril of Denna Dorwin. Um, Let's see, Kyle is actually releasing information on his on the 22nd, but we're recording on the 20th, so I have no information on his, so keep an eye out for that. But you can go onto each of these authors' websites and read kind of the synopsis for the story and see the covers and just see what amazing stuff we have in store. So just keep your eyes glued to all of our websites because we're going to continue to release information about that um, as the weeks go by. It's very exciting. <laughs> Um, let's see, Kirsten, do you want to talk about E.B. Dawson's new release? Uh, yeah, uh, E.B. Dawson just released The Citizen, which is the second book in her Lost Empire trilogy, the first one being The Traveler. I've already read it. It's amazing. You should go read it if you haven't already. <laughs> nice. And I think, Jill, also, you read this one, too. Yes, yeah, I was one of the beta readers, so I haven't gone through the changes she's made. I know she worked very hard on them, and uh, I'm sure she did an amazing job. The book is incredible. Yes, I just started reading it last night, and it's amazing, so definitely. You are in for that. some twists and turns. Oh, oh. Yeah. Good luck not putting it down. <laughs> no, I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> Probably should be. All right. <laughs> Just, you know, you can't exactly avoid feels in a Dawson novel. It's true. So that book is also linked below. So go ahead and check that out. And then Jill, you have release news as well. Yes. Yeah. Um, this month, October, is all Raven Tree all month long, uh, seeing as though Raven Tree is a ghost story and it's October. So there's a couple small announcements. Um Last month, the fifth episode came out. That was the finale. So this month, I put out a complete collection of the first season. Uh, you can get that on ebook. You can read it on Kindle Unlimited. And you can also get a paperback. And if you are interested in getting in the paperback, um, you actually have a chance to win one of two annotated copies. So think of this as like the director's cut. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go through and draw some pictures and sign them and put some little notes in, like some of my inspiration and some of my struggles. 
So you'll be able to read all those fun little notes in there as well. So if you go into the extras page on my website, the contest will be there. Um, and then also on Halloween and one day only, all five episodes will be free to download, whether you're in Kindle Unlimited or not. And you can buy the co- complete collection for only 99 cents as an ebook. Very cool. So I would like to say that I own the physical copy, not the annotated one, but a physical copy of the Raven Tree Society. And it's beautiful. And I have it sitting out on my uh, bookshelf because it's just really cool looking. Um, Ah, thank you. Pool Publishing did an amazing job. I love it so much. Yeah, she's awesome. So that contest that Jill was just talking about is also linked below. So go ahead and enter that because it's a really cool book. And I can't imagine how cool the annotated copy is going to be. So get in on that. (laughs) And that is all we have for the news this month. Um, So now we can move to story time. Uh, Jill, do you have any interesting stories that happened this month? (laughs) Uh, this month, oh my goodness. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a, I don't have a ton of interesting writing stories this month. I've kind of been taking a little bit of a break from writing. Um, I'm still working on uh, Sealing Freedom, which has been a struggle, but that's mostly because I'm burned out from three releases in less than a month. Um, but uh, I've been doing the cover for Janelle Garrett's third book in the Steward Saga series. Hmm. I'm very excited about it. Um, and today, actually, I'm going to be uh, getting my button gear and trying to finish that cover for her. So I'm really excited about that. That's awesome. Uh, Kristen, what about you? Um, not too many big writing stories this time because I've been somewhat on a writing hiatus it's like I'm sometimes I don't write sometimes I work on the two lives three choices sequel which is coming I'm slowly getting there and then also working on the short story which I still need to edit (laughs) for the anti-hero part of contribution yes so no big story it's just plugging along awesome um, I'm kind of in the same space, though I was actually super excited because I found out that there is actually a perk to being a writer and a college student, um, <laughs> which Kristen knows she's just out of college, so it's really hard to be an indie author and also be going to college, um, <laughs> just time commitment-wise. Um, but this semester, I'm t- I usually take a ton of science classes. This semester, I'm taking just liberal arts classes, so I have to write a ton of papers And I found out that being a blogger slash author has given me like magical writing powers. So I can do all of these projects in like an hour and still get A's and it's the best feeling on earth. So (laughs) yay! So that's that's currently the only upside that I've found, but it's a pretty good one. So I'm excited. Yeah, it doesn't work when you're writing code, unfortunately. (laughs) That's true. It also doesn't work like for writing lab reports and things so I feel like it's only specifically papers that you would do in English classes better than nothing yeah that's true um all right so that is all we have for just our general stuff so we can get into our discussion which is we're going to talk about writing lessons we've learned from the Chronicles of Narnia so first um before we get into our main discussion or before we go further up and further in to our main discussion um let's list our favorite chronicles of narnia books um just from our favorite to least favorite uh, Kristen, do you want to go first sure um it was really hard for me to rank these <laughs> me too oh so, okay so Line the Witch in the Wardrobe is probably my top favorite, although it's constantly in competition with Silver Chair, so those two are kind of tied for first. The Magician, sorry, the Magician's Nephew's next, followed by Prince Caspian, Voyage of the Dawn Trider, Last Battle, and Horses Boy is my least favorite, but I might need to give it another chance because I think that's both yours and Jill's yes. or favorite. So. And another friend told me I needed to reread that, so I'll just re- reread that and <laughs> postpone all the spaghetti and rotten fruit that'll head my way for saying that it's really 
yes, please reread it. And if it's still your least favorite, just lie to me because that makes me really sad. <laughs> I haven't read that since I was like 10 in my defense. Okay, got it. Uh, Jill, what about you? Uh, yeah, well, as uh, Kirsten noticed, Horst and his boy is top of the list. Um, Silver Chair is next. Uh, Prince Caspian, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Magician's Nephew, and Last, uh, The Last Battle, which I'll admit is partially on theological differences. Got it. All right, so for me, it is um, The Horse and His Boy is my favorite. And then The Magician's Nephew, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, The Silver Chair, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Last Battle, and Prince Caspian. Um, was I the only person who didn't put The Last Battle as my least favorite? Kristen, was that your least favorite as well? Um, the least favorite was Horse and His Boy. Oh, right. Oh, last Battle was second to last. Did yeah. I mention I got up at 8.30 to record this? I'm sorry. <laughs> I was so shocked and it just completely left my brain already. All right. Um, so let's talk about what is it about the series that makes it a favorite fandom of yours, Jill? Yeah, I think um, I'm a great lover of all classics. Um, I I love everything around these stories, everything around C.S. Lewis, everything around uh, Tolkien, um, the Inklings, like everything about it is just so magical and so otherworldly and yet at the same time so grounded. So um, I think probably one of my favorite things about the series is that C.S. Lewis has this instant ability to both um, make something very... Um, imaginative and to describe it very loosely and yet to be very specific. So I think there was one commentator who said, um, C.S. Lewis, like his dogs are very doggy. Like they act like dogs, even though they're talking They're like, you can imagine an actual dog running around acting like that. So he doesn't spend a lot of time on details and that way he's kind of the opposite of Tolkien, who was his contemporary, one of his closest <laughs> friends. So, you know, they're easy to compare. Um, he doesn't give a lot of detail and the detail that he does give, you wouldn't think it's that specific. And yet he allows the reader to really engage their imagination and to become part of the story in a very unique way and to make it very, very tactile and very um, immersive and very experiential. And I think that's probably the favorite, my favorite thing about his writing and about the series. Like, yes, there's other things, the world building, the way he slips in the theology, um, the characters, but yeah, it's, I'm just so in awe of how he has the ability to use his words with so much power. That's awesome. Yeah, that's actually a really good point because my favorite thing, one of my favorite things at least, is I love how magical his series is. Like it has a very, it has a certain like fairy tale quality to it that makes it mm -hmm. accessible to kids and adults as well. Um, and now that I think about it, that is probably due to that. Um, specificity like the way he goes about um describing things which I hadn't actually picked up on so that's really cool um and then just from because I write Christian fiction I also really like how he wove the messages into his story that's always really impressive to me um because I don't think I ever felt like he was hitting me over the head with any of his yeah. messages some of them some messages were pretty obvious at points but I do kind of think that that's because it was children's fiction specifically and it wasn't ever obvious in a bad way it was just like oh this is still really creative um so just that it, that's really hard to do but he was able to weave all of these christian messages through everything from like character de development to world building to plot and he kind of didn't leave anything any part of his world untouched as far as the christian themes and i think that's really cool um so that's probably one of my favorite parts what about you kirsten I think one of my favorite parts is kind of similar to yours, Hannah. I think what I really like is, I guess it's kind of threefold. Um, first, that the Christian parallels and allegorical elements are woven in really well into the story. I mean, it's not hitting you over the head at all, It's, but it's definitely there. The second part is that even though there were Christian parallels and allegorical elements, Lewis didn't let that be an excuse to 
kind of slip up on all the other elements. I mean, the world building is still really strong. The character development, I think, is still really strong. And I mean, he's managed to keep the creative aspect writing aspects there, even with the Christian heroes. Like the two are working in harmony, which I always thought was really cool. And then the third thing is. I think one of the reasons why it can be so engaging for adults and for kids is that even though it's still children's fiction and there are some points where it's obvious, there's also some really subtle points as well that, you know, the adults can pick up on, yeah. especially if they're rereading the series. So it's like Lewis, Lewis makes it easy for children to read it, but he doesn't necessarily dumb it down if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. And I always think that must have been really hard because we do even nowadays think, oh, children's fiction is just kind of this lower form of writing. But he was clearly just not having that. He was like, no, I'm going to make this into an amazing story for children because children can still read stories that have a lot of different layers to them. So I always really admired that. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think the the description or lack thereof actually adds to that a lot because the reader brings so much to the story. So if you think of his battle scenes, like he doesn't actually go through and describe the battle scenes. So you could be like, oh, wow, C.S. Lewis is very gory and his battle scenes are like really intense. And, you know, specifically thinking of um, Prince Caspian, there's a battle scene where he kind of slightly describes as, you know, one of the fiercest of broadsword battles. And, you know, um, the movie interpreted that very, very differently than as a child. So it really kind of depends on what you're bringing to it. So it can, it can level up and be more intense when you're imagining it as being more intense, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and that's a good point about the movies, because I remember one of the things about the movies when I watched it, I would always think, oh, that's not how I remember that in the book. That's not how I pictured it. But then when I go back and read the book, I think, oh, well, I can see why they did some of those things, because it is kind of up to the imagination, or director's imagination anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what about writing lessons? What lessons have you learned just from the series in general and then your favorite book in particular or your least favorite book in particular? Kirsten, do you want to go first? <laughs> sure. I'll be doing my favorite book to avoid the wrath of both of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's see. I think... One of the writing lessons I learned from Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was I'm trying to figure out the best way to word this, but I don't know. I just love the world building in his book, so sorry if I geek out about that too much. But I kind of liked how he introduced things, you know, piece by piece, like the, you know, getting into the wardrobe, there's the, the wood, there's the lamppost, which is a distinctive feature and eventually plays into the magician's nephew. So debatable on whether you consider that an Easter egg or not since magician's nephew hadn't been written at that time. But um, then you know, inter start introducing the creatures and the antagonists. Like he's really good at giving bits and pieces of information while still making a plot engaging. And it's not thrown over your head or shoehorned in. It's all pretty natural. Right, because everything he added was not like he used it in the story later on. So it wasn't like, oh, here are some random beavers. Like the beavers actually had to do with the plot. So not only were they a really cool piece of world building, but they also were necessary to the storyline, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. Just, it all blended together. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot that you can learn um, on all levels from these stories. I think kind of like on the beginner level to look at just the fact that these are portal fiction. Um, and it makes it really easy for C.S. Lewis to be able to introduce the reader into the character's perspective and give them that sense of wonder. Because if he had started, for instance, with Horse and His Boy, we are starting from the perspective of someone who grew up there, who lives there. But in the majority of the books, we're, we're introduced to the story from the perspective of someone who's never seen it before. So we're given an, a kind of invitation to step into that wonder and that awe, whether it be um, 
in in uh, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where we're stepping into this winter world, or whether it be in The Magician's Nephew, where you have this expanse of all these worlds that you could explore, and, and your imagination can go wild for hours thinking, well, what if they go into this pool? What's over in this pool? What's over in this pool? Like, there's, there's so much wonder in that, I think... Um, just as a writer, you know, writing uh, f- writing science fiction and trying to be able to allow the reader to step into that world, I chose to start from the perspective of a character who didn't know what was going on in in what we would call the fantastic worlds in the hero's journey, that, that kind of stepping over the threshold into something else. So it it allows the reader to kind of step into that experience with them, you know, and so there's that beginner level stuff. And then there's expert level stuff. I think I'm the only um, writer of non-Christian here. Both you guys are Christian fiction. Um, And I'm a Christian, but I chose specifically not to write Christian fiction for multiple reasons. And I think um, allegory carries a lot of inherent dangers in it. And I think C.S. Lewis managed to sidestep a lot of those characters, a lot of those dangers just by choosing the things that he did um, to, you know, for instance, like I said, I had theological differences with the last battle and and his choice to include that made it much less enjoyable for me, whereas his choice to kind of step back and allow us to experience the Christian faith in that, once again, that experiential kind of magical way um, allows the reader to ask questions and go searching for themselves for the answers versus um, at some Christian fiction. And both you guys do an excellent job of avoiding this, but some Christian fiction has a tendency to be like, hey, this is straight up propaganda and I'm going to hit you over the face. And this is, you know, here is my wise Christian character who's going to go on for two chapters about what the gospel is and which faith is wrong and which faith is right. So I think, you know, that's that's an expert level thing because there's no way to be like, oh, this percentage of this and this percentage of that makes for good Christian fiction. Like it, it's, it really does take a lot of wisdom and a lot of prayer. Yeah. Um, Definitely. Yeah, for sure. And I wanted to join Kirsten in geeking out about the world building um, yeah, so one thing that always fascinated me about his series is so multiple books, right? But every book has a very distinct world. Like, it's not always mm. set in the same world. Or even if it is taking place in Narnia, it's taking place in different areas. So each world has a very distinct feel to it. Like, The Horse and His Boy is Desert. The Magician's Nephew is very, like... Um, like between worlds and the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, it takes place mostly on a boat or on islands. Um, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, mostly in some kind of ice realm. And so he was, you could tell he was constantly pushing himself to come up with new ideas. He wasn't ever relying on um, what he had built in past books, but he was using it to make his next book even better. Mm. Um, so I think that was really, that's always inspired me as a writer, that he never kind of stagnated. He was always moving forward and creating new things in his world. Um, which I think is really important for world building is that you're always adding something new because the yeah. world is huge. And so you do, that should be reflected in your fiction. And he really did a great job of that. Yeah, and, yeah he definitely did. Yeah. And another thing I love about him was his character arcs, specifically like the redemption arcs for Edmund and Eustace. Because not only did he show those arcs in a really realistic way, but they played into the stories later on and into the characters. Um, And Mm -hmm. I think that that's something writers can sometimes forget to do, is they'll have this character go on this massive character arc. And then, you know, they've learned from it, and they never really... It's not reflected in their character later on in later books. Whereas, like, with Edmund specifically, that was a huge part of his character um, later on. Yeah, he's he's my favorite. Because mm-hmm, he was more willing to like give people second chances, and he was very like um, wise and compassionate, and you could tell that that was because of what he had been through and because of his arc. Um, so it was an mm-hmm. ongoing development for him, which I loved. Yeah, and he was learning from his mistakes too. I mean, realizing okay, Lucy's more on to in tune with Narnia 
than the rest of us. The last time I didn't believe her, I was ended up looking stupid. Let's listen to her this time. Right. And giving Eustace the benefit of a doubt, realizing, eh, he, he was actually better than I was. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I will say the horse and his boy as well, um, I think was probably the first fantasy I read that was a desert fantasy. And I think that's probably why I ended up writing a desert fantasy myself. Because I remember as a kid thinking, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Why do people not do this more often? And then now here I am. <laughs> desert <laughs> elves. So. <laughs> um, yeah. So did anybody have other writing lessons that they had learned? A million. A million, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think going deeper, probably um, Kristen... Kristen mentioned it, the um, uh, Edmund's character arc and, and that part in um, Prince Caspian where Edmund is uh, faced with the question of whether or not he's going to believe his younger sister. Um, and the older two made the choice not to. And, and him making the choice to believe her about Aslan, um, I think that the power in that, that character arc, that's definitely why I love Prince Caspian as much as do, is that, that one scene, um, but then also Aslan's character. Um, Aslan, I think, <clears throat> one of the reasons why I refuse to write Christian fiction, and, you know, I might someday in the future, um, but I feel like there is a danger in wanting to translate Christianity and specifically translate God to make him easier for people to swallow, to make him more desirable to the public, because we have the Bible, we have God. He did not give us an easier to swallow version of himself. He came to be translated to the human experience and the gospel is the gospel. So there is a great danger in going into writing a story and feeling as if um, here I am writing this story for unbelievers to make it easier for them to swallow versus here I am going into this story and presenting these characters for people to ask questions about. And I believe that Aslan walks that line very, very, um, there are times that I feel like Aslan steps over a little bit. Um, and like I said, that, that would be in the last battle for sure. Um, where he was translating C.S. Lewis's ideas of things. But the way that Aslan interacts with the children and specifically with Lucy and with Edmund, um, it just creates this longing to experience something like that, where you're like, here is this lion who is terrifying, who is huge. And I love the line where Lucy is like, um, Aslan, you're bigger. And he says, every year you grow, so shall I. Um, and, and just that that creating that longing where it's not like, here, here I am going to repackage the Christian faith so that it's easier for you to swallow. And I think even if you're an unbeliever listening to this and trying to translate this, because it's going to be very hard to talk about Narnia and our love for Narnia and not talk about Christianity. But this comes across for any any belief system, if you are trying to write your, your understanding, your belief into your writing, you can still learn from this. But I think that C.S. Lewis, you could tell his heart in it was not to be like, here, let me make God into bite-sized pieces for children to be able to swallow. It was more of an invitation. Let me show you how vast and wonderful and wide this thing is and how beautiful it is. And I think that that's why Narnia has stood the test of time when so much Christian fiction has fallen aside is because C.S. Lewis came to it with that humility and that love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that really stood out that he wasn't trying to kind of box Aslan in into like a very specific personality because there was that those scenes where all the kids are playing with Aslan, but then other scenes like that one where somebody a character asks like, "Well, is he safe?" and the answer was basically, "Well, no, of course he's not safe. He's a giant lion who's very powerful." Um and yet he still like loved these characters. Um so I do think that like you said, that it was really impressive that he was able, because he was very, like, he wrote a bunch of books that were 
focusing on theology. And so the fact that he was able to rein mm-hmm. that in um, to the point where he was more, um, he wasn't preaching so much as asking questions and letting us kind of come along and ask those questions with him. And I always think that's a really good example of how Christian fiction should be. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I never thought of that before. Yeah. Um, trying to think of other yeah like you said Jill there were so many lessons I learned I'm having a hard time like sorting through all of them um one thing I will say so this is kind of moving on to our other question which is are there things C.S. Lewis did that you think should be avoided and for me personally I don't I liked everything that he did but I do think that his writing this series in particular has set a really bad precedent for Christian fiction which was not his fault. Um, We just kind of took it and ran with it. And I don't think he would be pleased with what we've done. Um, But he did this like kind of new thing for Christian fiction where it was for children. Um, So it was very clean and it had very clear allegories, like specifically Aslan being the allegorical Jesus story. And I think um, ever since then, most Christian fiction has been that way. It's been very clean and it's always like had this kind of sometimes shoehorned in allegorical Jesus story or Jesus figure. Um, Like Kirsten did a really good job with hers because you do have kind of a God slash Jesus figure in your two lives, three choices, but it's specific to your world building. And so it makes sense that it's there. Um, Mm -hmm. Some Christian stories don't do that. And so it's very clearly like they're trying to copy C.S. Lewis but they're not C.S. Lewis and you know, they will never be. And that's fine. Um, but they've been kind of Christian fiction has been kind of boxed into this C.S. Lewis style, really clean, um, like really kind of safe. Like we're just copying what this great author has done and we should not stray from this because it worked that one time. So it should work from now on. Um, so it's led to this just kind of bland Christian fiction. Um, and so for me, it's been um, a lesson that I should always be learning from these great authors, but not copying them and challenging myself to write what is within my style. Because while I love C.S. Lewis, um, I'm not him. So my style is going to be different. Mm -hmm. My approach is going to be different. Um, So just because he did something and it worked for him doesn't necessarily mean that we as Christian writers need to be following exactly in his footsteps. And Kirsten, you looked like you were about to say something. I'm just trying to think of any other lessons. Uh, like, <laughs> like, okay, pick one out of somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I think you make a really, really good point with that, Hannah, about how um, how C.S. Lewis is kind of held up as the epitome of Christian, specifically Christian fantasy. Um, and I do know he wrote some science fiction as well, and I haven't read that, and though I really desire to, I don't I don't think it will be anytime soon. Um, but it is kind of odd to think that at the same time, C.S. Lewis is also, he would have been very contentious at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, his books would not have been considered clean at the time. And even still, there are some people who do not consider them clean because they include magic and because they include Greek myths such as Bacchus. Um, I have actually read an article arguing that um, the Narnia series is satanic and oh. is the entrance into witchcraft and Satanism because they open people up to kind of a safer version of witchcraft um so i think any kind of fantasy requires um a little bit of of an adventurous spirit um c.s lewis is kind of the uh the beginner's theologian in that um his books all of his books uh he writes a lot of theological books um they're very very good and they're in the same way accessible to anyone of any you know level of theological geekery, whether you are in the basics and reading you know um, mere Christianity, or whether you are you know looking for something a little complex and you pick up the True Tip letters. They're really understandable for anybody, um, but there is there is no safe way to make everyone happy. You're gonna have to take some risks and. Um, it really, fiction. It really is about asking yourself and asking the Lord the question of what 
what would he have you do? What is, you know, what should be included and going back to the Bible. Um, so yeah, there's, there is, there is no safe way to go with this. You, doesn't no matter what you write, there's going to be someone coming against you and saying that it was wrong. Right. And I love your point about C.S. Lewis, that, that when he published The Chronicles of Narnia, it was not a safe thing to do. I always forget that. Um, but I don't think children's fiction was common yeah. at the time, uh, definitely not allegorical Christian fiction. So he really did just kind of break into this whole new genre, and he did an amazing job. But I'm sure, like, if there are people nowadays writing articles about him being satanic, then I can't imagine what kind of feedback he was getting um, back when he was alive. So that's a yeah, really well, we have another lesson Sorry, we can ahead. learn is just, uh, you know, pray about it, write it, yeah. do a good job. And there are people who are, are not going to like it, and, you know, that's just part of part of the territory so you just keep moving moving forward and trying to become better as a writer and a person yeah and as we have one of our own authors who who has talked about how he has been um criticized by people for including magic in his stories and how that is considered not clean and unchristian and whatnot Mm -hmm. um and he doesn't even write christian fiction specifically he doesn't write message fiction um so yeah there is no way to make everybody happy so i think in comparison with you you the two of you um my books are a lot more um i'm not going to say adventurous because adventurous defines is defined differently um my books are a lot more offensive to a lot of christians i think um but that's, you know, that's what I felt called to do. And I definitely prayed and studied before I wrote what I wrote. And I, I took wisdom from a lot of people. So when it comes to writing, and I think, you know, C.S. Lewis, like I said, there are parts in his, his, both his theology and the Chronicles of Narnia that I do not agree with. Um, he is a universalist, and that is quite clear in what he was writing. Um, but I don't begrudge him his right to do that. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, he had, he had the right to write those things. And I, I don't begrudge that to him as a person. I I think he wrote what he felt convicted to write. And in the end, that's all any of us can do, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Um, especially like you said, your stories, Jill, do tend to be a little bit more, like dark and intense, I guess. Um, and I can see how, you know, Christians might freak out about that. But I do, you can see that you were very thoughtful about it. And I don't think that anything that you put in there was something that is outside of what we're allowed to discuss as Christians. Um, or not even what we should be discussing as Christians. Um, and so I do think that if we're to learn anything about C.S. Lewis is that he really did um, defy the current standards. So rather than using him as his stories as a template, we should be using his decision-making as a template. Um, So rather than saying, oh, C.S. Lewis wrote this clean, like straight-up allegorical fiction, so that's what Christian fiction should be, it should be. Instead, C.S. Lewis was challenging what Christian fiction was. Um, and he was very thoughtful and did a lot of things that had not been done before. And that's what we should be using as a template instead. And again, for people who maybe aren't writing Christian fiction, that goes for any type of fiction, really. You shouldn't be sticking to a template, but just always constantly trying to see what works for me, what works for my story, um, and what should I be writing mm-hmm. about versus what do people expect me to be writing about? <laughs> so, Did anyone have any other like just miscellaneous thoughts about his series i think that kind of covers it for me (laughs) (laughs) i think so it's making me want to go back and reread all of his stuff um yeah i need to reread. oh you should consider looking into focus on the family does a theatrical reading of them and we had them all as children and um, my mom did read the series to us as children, but I grew up on these theatrical retellings and oh my goodness, they're so amazing. Um, I think they're narrated by his stepson. 
Oh. Uh, so you get little bits and pieces of of him saying how his dad would come down excited to read something and the interaction that his dad had with his mom. And, and so um, it's really just, it's a whole new experience. I just love them so much. Uh, I keep looking at them thinking I need to buy them for my own kids. And I know they do a variety of different classics and I haven't, I don't think I've read, I've listened to the other ones, but those ones are amazing. That's so cool. I'll have to check that out. Cause I know like yeah. I have my series from what my parents read me as a kid and they're all kind of, you know, wrinkly and falling apart cause I've read them so many times. Um, yeah so I'm always then, kind of yeah I'm like I love them so much but I'm afraid to pick them up because I don't want to hurt them because they're so old so maybe I'll give the theatricals a, a look or listen yeah yes and hey if you guys are going to take anything from C.S. Lewis for your writing I want more talking animals <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty awesome. I actually, my original version of the Terebinth Tree Chronicles, like that world, um, did have so many talking animals. Um, they ended up getting cut because they were not necessary to the story. They were just like, I clearly loved C.S. Lewis and I put a ton of talking animals into them. <laughs> um, I know, I know Beth, Bethany Wangler said something about adding them to her series. Um and definitely, if you guys enjoy, I, I'm going to say, especially if you enjoy um, The Horse and His Boy, but if you enjoy C.S. Lewis in general, you should go check out the Paralane um, book on our website. And I, uh, I'm going to start sending it out to our newsletter soon. But yes, talking animals, sure, they're, you know, griffins and, and sphinxes, but um, definitely kind of, I feel like that story has, has a C.S. Lewis flair to it. Yeah, it definitely does. Um, I can't remember what chapter we first saw Talking Animals, but I remember thinking, oh, yes, we went that direction. <laughs> like, so oh, well, it was chapter, chapter one. one. Oh. Yeah, E.B. Dawson put in Festus, and it was just like, and E.B. Dawson wrote the first chapter and kind of started it for us, kicked it off for us, and I feel like every author after that was just like, oh my goodness, this is the most awesome sandbox of play in ever. And next thing we know, there's like dragons and there's there's just <laughs> like people with mind reading abilities and mechanical cars. And it was just awesome. So I'm, I'm very, very excited to see. I know we're, we're kind of working on, on where that will go, um, but uh we've talked a few times about what's going to happen when that finishes and I'm so excited. It definitely, I feel like it definitely has a C.S. Lewis flair to it though. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I also like the mix of sci-fi and fantasy in there. That's so <laughs> cool. Did you say it's, we're sending it out to newsletter people soon? Uh, this, this next month I'm going to start sending out a chapter a month the newsletter. So we are on chapter 10 on our website and we come out with a new chapter every month. So if you want to check it out and read up to chapter 10, you know, no need to wait for the newsletter, but yes, we're going to start sending that out to the newsletter. Awesome. So you all, it is a really fun story. So I'm going to link it, it below and then also link the newsletter below and just go <laughs> read it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's amazing. I love it. Every time I get to write a chapter, I get all giddy. <laughs> awesome. All right. So I think that concludes our C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia discussion. Unless anybody had anything to add. I think we kind of went over, f fangirled a lot over this. So, <laughs> um, The world building is amazing. Yes. Talking yes. animals, themes, all good <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Now yes. I'm trying to figure out how to put talking animals in my story. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Make it happen, Chris. I'm sure there's some scientific advice, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So moving on to book club. Um, what are we all reading this month? Um, Kirsten, what are you reading? Well, I read The Citizen by E.B. Dawson earlier so just finished reading that um 
right now for for those of you who don't know, I co-host a hashtag author book club on Twitter with Bethany Wengler. For that, we're reading The Hounds of the Baskervilles by oh. Arthur Conan Doyle. So it's my first Sherlock mystery, so I'm excited. Oh, how are you liking it so far? Oh, I'm liking it a lot. Still trying to figure out how it, like, because I've seen some of the movie adaptations and the BBC series is like, okay, adjust to 18th century. Right. Or whatever century it's in, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that always fascinated me about his mysteries is I don't think I'm ever able to figure out like who did it or anything, or like what's going on I feel like he's one of the only mystery writers where I'm just like I have no idea what's happening but it's still great so yeah I mean worst case all the deductions it was fun to watch or read <laughs> like we're trying to figure it out piece by piece mm -hmm. uh Jill what are you reading um once again I am juggling a lot um so for beta reads, I am beta reading uh, The Last Steward, which is the third book in Steward Saga by J uh, Janelle Garrett. And it is, it's amazing so far. I haven't gotten very far in and I'm going to kind of try and rush through it today. Um, but yes, very good. Um, so I'm also reading The Three Musketeers. Uh, this is my first time reading a Dumas book and I... I don't know why, but I tend to be like in love with that revolutionary era French history. Like all of it is just it's every time I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. And then I, you know, Beauty and the Beast and and <laughs> obviously my main character is named Bastille and no function. So we can see. <laughs> and and then when I found out that Dumas is actually um mixed, half African American back in that era. That made me want to read it even more. So I am loving it, except for the fact that all the men are very, very sensitive. Oh my goodness, they're dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of his characters are super dramatic. I think maybe they that has are. to do with like French people, like everybody. It's just ah, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like you bumped into me. I'm going to kill you yeah. now. Duel to the dead. <laughs> like what? <laughs> Yeah, that so, yeah. makes sense, because he also ran Can Monte Cristo as well, didn't he? Mm -hmm. Yes, he did, yeah. yeah. Yep. Did that recently, it's like, yeah, but his characters are all really sensitive. So dramatic. <laughs> like, I think you're overreacting, but that's okay, because it makes it more fun. <laughs> now I can see why he wrote a count who was going after revenge however many years after over something so dramatic when the characters are killing each other over, you know, belts. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I put that on hold to go ahead and read The House of the Baskerville. Again, it is, it's been one of my favorite stories. I love that kind of minor creep factor. I'm in love with the Moors. I, I want to go live on the Moors, and I want to put them in all of my books. <laughs> um, so, and I love, I'm about halfway through now and just got to the Moors again, and I'm like, ah! Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, it's one of my favorite stories. I've read it probably three or four times. And even now I'm going through and I'm like, wait, I think I know who did it. Am I remembering correctly? I think I know who did it. Um, so that's the other book I'm reading. And then I'm also reading on Kindle. Um, Rob Nugent wrote a very, very classical, um, low fancy uh, books. And I'm reading the first of that, which is The Fallen Banner, which um, I'm enjoying, but there are a lot of names, a lot of names. So it's going to take me a while to figure out who's doing what, but it's nice. Yeah. Um, so I'm reading less than both of you. I think my, I've, I don't know, I stopped doing this thread on Twitter, but I have had a lot of misadventures with my Kindle. Um, because it's evil and it hates me. So I keep like, it keeps disappearing or like the battery is mysteriously like always dead or it's just glitching or whatever. So I haven't been able to read a ton. Um, but I think I finally like found it and it's working <laughs> so far. So I'm reading The Citizen by E.P. Dawson. I'm about 30% of the way through and it's amazing. Um, just like the world building and the writing and the characters. I love it. Um, so I'm reading that. And then also uh, just some various comic books. Um, Thrawn by Jody Hauser, who's one of my favorite 
comic book authors, so I've been reading that, um, which is a Star Wars character. It's the blue guy for anybody who doesn't know. Um, and then Moon Knight by Jeff Lemire, and that one is a very strange, like, it's sci-fi fantasy superhero with kind of an Egyptian slant to it, to the world building. It's really unique, um, and I'm really enjoying it, so. And that's all I'm reading at the moment. So, yeah, so that concludes our um, podcast for today. So if you want more of our awesome Phoenix fiction um, you can visit our website at phoenixfictionwriters.com. We're on Twitter at phoenix underscore fiction, also on Facebook. Um, if you listen to this on iTunes, please leave us a review. If you listen to us on Google Play, I keep meaning to check how you show your appreciation on Google Play, and I have no idea. So, like, give us a thumbs up or a review or <laughs> however Google Play works. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube, give us a thumbs up. Uh, make sure to leave a comment, say hi, tell us about your favorite C.S. Lewis books, um, or least favorite C.S. Lewis books, unless it's Horse and His Boy, and then we don't want to hear from you. <laughs> I'm not going to put that down in mind. Nope. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. You, we, we won't judge. Um, so, yeah, just leave a comment, say hi. Uh, you can find me personally on Twitter at underscore Hannah Heath and on my website, hannahheathwriter.com. And from there, you can find me on all the social medias. So pop over to those and say hello. I'm always happy to hear from you. Uh, Jill, where can we find you? Yeah, the best place to go is my website, www.jillaneprazzi.com. That's J-I-L-L-A-N-E-P-U-R-R-A-Z-Z-I. Yes, I know it's hard. <laughs> um, you'll find links to all of my social media as well as extras, links to all of my books, etc. So that's that's kind of the hub. That's the place, best place to go. Yeah. And for me, kind of similar, best place to go is my website, which is klpiercebooks.com. And yeah, from there, you can find where I am on social media. I think I'm on Goodreads, Instagram, Facebook. And I think the handle for all those is at klpiercebooks. So that should be pretty easy. Awesome. All right, so all the things are linked below. Uh, be sure to share this podcast around with your friends and just online. Um, and if you have things or other fandoms that you'd like us to talk about in the future, go ahead and leave those in the comments. And as long as at least three of us know a little bit about that fandom, we will do a podcast on it. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, thank you so much for listening. We will see you next month um, where I think... I we're still settling. We may talk about Wattpad or we may talk about dialogue. And so just keep an eye out for that. Because either way, it's going to be a lot of fun. All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.